The Cavaliers get their revenge on the Boston Celtics. Can the Browns get revenge on the Denver Broncos today? We're going to get into all of that right now. So welcome on into the Crockpot Podcast. It's your boy, Chef Zay, and I appreciate you tuning into another episode. Make sure you guys are liked up, subscribed up, wherever you at listening to the podcast. Make sure you tapped in with that notey on because we dropping episodes weekly. So without further ado, let's get right into this, man. I, I think you start nowhere else other than Donovan Mitchell. Um, with Donovan Mitchell, you know, the, the big question surrounding Donovan Mitchell that I remember people asking was, can Donovan Mitchell be a number one player on a championship team? Yes. 1000% Donovan Mitchell can be a best player on a championship team. And yesterday was a perfect example of it. You're going up against the defending champions. You're He had five points going into the second half. In the fourth quarter, when you needed him most, they, I think the Boston's got the lead up to eight or ten. They were, they were knocking on the door of double digits. And then Donovan Mitchell turns on the switch and goes full freaking takeover. I do want to talk about Darius Garland, but I just wanted to make sure that I give... You know, Donovan Mitchell is credit. He ended with 35, seven rebounds, three assists, two steals, one block. I mean, all over the six of 11 from three. If you're getting this Donovan Mitchell, we can beat anybody in the league. Like th this Donovan Mitchell, I think makes the Cavs arguably the best team in the, if not the best team in the league, the second or third best team in the league, because he has that superstar power, like a Tatum, like a, like a, a John Moran, like a Braun, like he has that superstar talent to where it's like, oh, fourth quarter's here? Let me turn it on. So hats off to Donovan Mitchell. Now, let's talk about Darius Garland. Because last game versus Boston, I had a lot to say about Darius Garland. He shot 3 of 21 from the field. He did absolutely nothing in terms of scoring the ball, facilitating the ball. He was doing pretty much nothing throughout that entire game. And when we needed him most, he was ghost. That wasn't the case today. Because if you look back at the box score from the Boston Celtics game the first time, you see a glaring notice and how important and the things that I talk about most uh, uh, when we lost to them, the glaring notice is that if you can get this contribution from your second best player, that is when the, the, the role players can get that thing and it's like, okay, I can look at the box score and be like, damn, Niang 11, Ty 10, Craig 15. You get that from your bench, guys. You're set. And then you look over and you see Darius Garland, 8.7 assists, 2 rebounds, having ultimately no effect on the game, 0 of 6 from the 3-point line. Evan Moldy, 22 points, Jared Allen, 10, Donovan Mitchell still with his 35. Like, this was the box score before. Granted, Boston shot the 3 ball really well. But it's such a better impact when your number one and your number two players are thriving, because let's look at the box score from last night and the difference in, uh, that it was, because there's a glaring difference in the box score. Darius Garland, 22 points, and then the rest of it, it just falls in line. Evan Mobley had nine, one of his worst games of the year. Isaac Okoro had six, hit some big-time shots, perfect from the field. Jared Allen, 8.10 rebounds, not doing much offensively. Um... Uh, George Niang was huge, hitting threes. I mean, th this guy would be the Anderson Verizal of this Cavalier team if we didn't have so many players that you could just be like, oh my gosh, Ty Jerome, oh my gosh, Karis LeVert. Like, George Niang has the personality, he has the grit, and he's playing really, really good basketball right now. But back to the Darius Garland thing. When you, when you can get your second best player to contribute like the way that he did. Now, now I know he didn't do anything in the fourth quarter. He had 18 in the fourth quarter, and he got four points due to the, the fouling game. So ultimately, he would have ended with 18 points, and he did nothing. But that's fine because he still gave you. He still, If you take away the four free throws, he still gave you five of 12 from the field, four of six from the three, eight assists, and five rebounds. He still was contributing, and the big credit, I don't know if you guys saw it at the end of the game, they were getting the switch on to Tatum to Darius Garland, and he was holding his own when it mattered most. Was it a mismatch? A thousand percent. Does Jason Tatum more than likely get the foul call or make the layup in that situation? 
A hundred percent. But guess what? He didn't yesterday, and that is a credit to Darius Garland. Also, a credit to uh, credit to Kenny Atkinson keeping Darius Garland on the field, knowing that it could be a defensive liability on the switch like that. He got the switch off from Jared Allen to Darius Garland, and Darius Garland. I know what play. I know you know what play I'm talking about when Jason Tatum drives, and it looks like there was a lot of contact there, and he doesn't get the foul call. That's a lot of credit to Darius Garland on that defensive stop. So it's it's definitely. It's such a better feel. It's such a smoother process. It, when you're watching the game, it's like, oh, we aren't out of this because Darius Garland's doing good. Donovan Mitchell just turned it up in the fourth quarter. It's when Darius Garland, this is why I say you can't win a championship without Darius Garland. You need, or some type, or, or if you trade him, I don't think he's getting traded. I'm just saying, like, if you found somebody that could do the same thing he does, you can't win a championship without his contribution. And yesterday was the perfect example of that. Um, so major hats off to Darius Garland, and like I said, I already gave my credit to George Niang. I think what he's doing, <laughs> I think what he's doing is just fun. Like I, I would have loved to see him uh, without these players that are so lovable: Ty Jerome, Karis Levert, uh, Evan Mobley, and these guys. Because I think we would be looking at George Niang like an Anderson Vergeau type guy, just a lovable, lovable player. Um, but that's gonna be. Let's let. That's enough for the Cavs. A quick little recap there. Um, we got to transition into the Browns because it's game day today. It, it, it's game day today, and we need our revenge back in Denver because last year of uh, versus Denver, we lost. And not only did we lose, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't. That game, man. <laughs> the the way that they handled DTR, um, the way that they handled DTR last year was just it was mind boggling because. What is you doing? Ultimately, it led to Joe Flacco and the rest is history. You know how that went out. But we're looking for our revenge going back to Denver. And Jerry Judy is on the forefront of that, saying, I want to kick their ass. That's what he wants to do. Let me see if I can pull it up real quick so I can get the exact quote. But it's basically it, it was basically that. I want to kick their ass. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have the tweet right here. But... I, I, I want this to be a Jerry Judy game. And you know why I think this should be a Jerry Judy game? Why it will be a Jerry Judy game? Because you have players on this team that understand the assignment. And the biggest person that needs to under, understand the assignment is Jameis Winston. We saw him go against the coach's call last year to get a running back into the end zone at the end of the game because he wanted him to score. You think Jameis Winston is not going to come out here and go above and beyond to it's not like Jerry Judy isn't getting the targets Jerry Judy is getting targets let's see last week he had um six of six caught all six balls amazing I, I'm pretty sure he's averaging like seven targets a game with Jameis Winston as his quarterback uh, against the New Orleans game he had 11 targets six of six catches for uh, on 11 targets I, I think Jameis Winston understands the assignment I think they'll make an emphasis on Jerry Judy. Now, will Patrick Sertain um, mirror Jerry Judy? I don't know if he'll mirror Jerry Judy, but if he does, it's going to be a matchup to watch. Um, familiar with each other, so it, it, it should be one of those things where we're watching and it's like, oh, this is this is football right here, right? This is football. Um, but I think that's going to be where my main matchup is next to this one that I'm about to talk about now, which is the Nick Chubb. Um, Nick Chubb's over and under was set at 67, I believe, 67 and a half, 62 and a half, 60 something. Whatever it is, it's the highest that it's ever been. And I think last week was a, was a, there, he's starting to rev it up a little bit. Now, I know when you look at the box where you see 20 carries for 59 yards, I don't remember the last time we saw Nick Chubb carry the ball 20 times and only average three yards per carry. But it does seem like he's getting his mojo back. The way that he's hitting the hole, the way that he's striding, the way that he's breaking off tackles. hes You could tell that he, he's absorbing the contact better than he was in the first couple weeks. Um, will he break the 100-yard mark? He's not going to have many games left to do so. Um, I think that's going to be one of the things that I, I, if I'm Nick Chubb, that would probably be something that I have circled as a goal of mine, which would be to break the 100-yard mark. Um, so I'm, I'm very curious to know how they handle the situation. Uh, Broncos, uh, Steelers, Chiefs, Bengals, Dolphins, Ravens. There's a 100-yard game in there somewhere. And if it ain't one, there's got to be at least two. The Bengals' defense is atrocious. I don't, 
I know it's more likely their secondary than their running game, but their defense is so bad that Nick Chubb could just find a way to do it. Um, this Dolphins game could be the one where they feed Chubb 20 plus times again, and that be a game where he goes over. And then I think this Broncos game is going to be another one where the Browns should be able to run the ball. I, I just think with everything that's at stake right now, there's nothing to lose these next few weeks. And I just, I, I don't know, man. I just want to see Nick Chubb break 100 yards. I think that's what I'm really getting at. Um, will Jameis, will Jameis continue to light it up? Because that's the, that's the third and final question that I have. Will he continue to light it up and will he earn his contract with the Cleveland Browns next year? Or if he continues to light it up the way that he does, will he price himself out? of the conversation for the Cleveland Browns. I think that's going to be the big thing that I'm watching for in the offseason is how what, what what are they going to do? Because if Jameis Winston continues to come out here and flourish these next one, two, three, five games, I don't I, I don't see how they I, I don't see how they let Jameis walk when they've already been down this path. The one thing that I've been noticing with this organization, they are trying to learn from their mistakes in previous years. You've already been through that debacle with Joe Flacco. Do you want to go through it again with Jameis Winston when I'd say 60 to 75% of the fan base is already all in on him? Uh, and, and, you know, as many times as I talk about the direction of this team and um, what it's going to look like the next few years, do you want to go into the offseason with uncertainty at the quarterback position and play the drafting game like I know a lot of people want to draft a quarterback in this draft but I, everything all the signs that I see that I'm getting it just doesn't have quarterback being the number one priority I think it is a obviously it's a number one priority but I think there's just so many areas that they can get at and if someone is willing to jump up and if we do continue to win games we can we can pretty much kiss ourselves out of that top quarterback conversation because we won't have a top five pick. So I, I, it's gonna, I'm, I'm anxious to see how they play this. But if we went out, I don't care about no draft pick. I, I want the playoffs. I'd rather win than get a draft pick. We need an offensive line. We could definitely use something at receiver. We obviously need a quarterback. I, I'm not saying that they're not going to take a quarterback, but I, I, I definitely think that Jameis has a prime opportunity to seal this job over the next few years and ultimately maybe I don't know how it would go but he could ultimately maybe price himself out I think that would be yet to yet to be determined because of the history of Jameis Winston everyone besides Browns fans there's a large camp of people well Jameis is just a matter of time before he's back to 30 30 Jameis Winston and throwing interceptions and da, 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 da. we know the story right um but I, but I'm I'm all in I, I think the bridge for Jameis um is perfect because if you guys listen to any of my live streams or, 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 or recent podcasts, you, you guys know that I think that Jimmy Haslam and, and D Haslam are have all their eyes set on um, Brook Park. I, 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 I don't know if they really, I'm not going to say they don't care about these next few years. I, I just don't think it's on the top of their priority list. I don't think uh, stacking upon something that's going to be demolished is going to like I think they want to create their own legacy. They inherited this legacy by buying. They didn't inherit it. They bought this legacy for two billion dollars, and it has gone sour since he's had it. I mean, people want Jimmy Haslam to sell the team. I don't personally. He he he. The one thing you want your owner to do is spend money. He spends a lot of it, and I just think he needs to take a step back as far as the football operation goes. Maybe we'll see that in Brook Park. Um, so th these next few weeks are going to be very, very interesting. I think it's going to tell a lot in terms of the direction that this team wants to go. Um, and I think it, we just need to buckle up because honestly, I don't know if anyone for certain, I don't think this was in their cards. I don't think sitting at three and eight was in their cards. I don't think they were prepared to be having these type of conversations with Jameis Winston, um, obviously you knew the Nick Chubb conversation was going to come up, but I think another thing that they're probably looking at is going to be Miles Garrett, uh, Denzel Ward, uh, David Njoku, like Wyatt Teller, uh, um, Joel Petonio, you know, the, these, there, there, there's going to be conversations and what that conversation is, whether it's a contract extension, whether it's trade talks, um, whether it's retirement, whatever it is, 
there's going to be a lot of conversations uh, in this offseason. I don't think anybody was prepared to be sitting here at 3-8 and eight and then having to decide what they want to do moving forward after this. I think they were looking at playoffs and they would, you know, go from there. So with that being said, let me know in the comments your guys' thoughts on the Cavs and in the Browns. What's going to be the final score of today? And give me your hottest take as far as a prediction stat line. Jerry Judy going for three touchdowns, six receptions, a buck 20. I don't know. Nick Chubb, 150 and, and on 17 carry. Let me know your hottest take in the comments, and I'll catch you guys in the next episode. Peace.